Welcome to the fourth session in our ICU curriculum. This session will be an introduction to shock. In this session, we will define shock, describe the physical exam abnormalities, including vital signs of a patient in shock, list the four main types of shock, and then develop a physical exam-based approach for working through the differential diagnosis in an undifferentiated shock patient. Let's start with a scenario. You are called to admit a patient, Mr. Smith, to the ICU. The workroom is incredibly busy, and all you can hear is he received a lot of fluid and he still looks terrible. His heart rate is fast, and his blood pressure is 70s over 40s, with a map of 50. You quickly hang up the phone and start to walk to the ER to see for yourself when the ICU nurse calls to tell you, Mr. Smith is up here. He looks awful. The nurse says, we need you at the bedside. His heart rate is 130, blood pressure is 65 over 45, and he is really sleepy and unable to tell us much. As you walk to the ICU, you think to yourself, is this patient in shock? And what do I need to do to figure out what is going on? In order to answer both of those questions, we need to start by defining what it means to be in shock. There are multiple definitions of shock throughout the literature. Principles of critical care define shock as evidence of multi-system organ hypoperfusion. Harrison's Principles of Internal Medicine define shock as a clinical condition of organ dysfunction resulting from an imbalance between cellular oxygen supply and demand. And the New England Journal of Medicine has defined shock as a clinical expression of circulatory failure that results in inadequate cellular oxygen utilization. If we combine these statements into a unified definition, we can say that shock is a state of inadequate perfusion or oxygen supply to meet demands of the body. While this definition is helpful, how can we better understand shock from a clinical perspective? It starts with this equation. MAP, or mean arterial pressure, equals cardiac output multiplied by systemic vascular resistance. This equation defines much of the physiology encountered within the ICU. From our prior definition, shock is a state of inadequate perfusion, which simply means a state of overall hypotension. Hypotension is clinically defined by a low mean arterial pressure. In order for a patient to have a low MAP, the cardiac output, the systemic vascular resistance, or both need to decrease. If one value decreases, the other variable will often increase in the short term to compensate. We will continue to refer to this equation throughout the remainder of the session. So, we've defined shock broadly and introduced the importance of the MAP equation. More importantly, what does a patient in shock look like? What sorts of vitals, physical exam findings, and lab abnormalities do we expect to see? An organized way to frame the physical consequences of shock is to go through the clinical manifestations in the same way information is collected and presented during the objective portion of bedside ICU teaching rounds. That is, first the vitals, then the physical exam, and finally, labs. First, the vitals. A person in shock may be febrile due to sepsis or an overall inflammatory state. Next, as just discussed, shock is a state of inadequate perfusion defined by hypotension and low mean arterial pressure. A mean arterial pressure of 60 to 65 is typically required to perfuse the vital organs. Therefore, shock needs to be considered for any patient with a MAP consistently below 60 to 65. Most patients in shock, but not all, are tachycardic. Tachycardia is typically a compensatory response. Referring back to the MAP equation, if we break it down further, cardiac output is equal to heart rate multiplied by stroke volume. Therefore, MAP equals heart rate times stroke volume times systemic vascular resistance. So, if the stroke volume or SVR decrease, for example, due to decreased blood volume or infection, the heart rate will increase in an attempt to compensate. Below are some examples of low stroke volume and low systemic vascular resistance states. Patients in shock may also be tachypneic. Tachypnea is either a manifestation of a primary lung problem, for instance pneumonia or pulmonary embolism, or the body's compensatory response to metabolic acidosis. Recall that the lungs help regulate acid-base balance in the body by varying the minute ventilation, and through changes in the minute ventilation, the amount of exhaled carbon dioxide. With a metabolic acidosis, the body will increase the respiratory rate and or tidal volume in order to try and blow off excess CO2. Put another way, the body responds to metabolic acidosis with a compensatory respiratory alkalosis. One comprehensive way to think about the vitals for a critically ill patient is the shock index. The shock index is the heart rate divided by the systolic blood pressure. While it may seem intuitive, a heart rate should not be consistently higher than a systolic pressure. From the example at the beginning of the session, a heart rate of 130 and systolic blood pressure of 65 will give a shock index of 2. A shock index greater than 0.9 is associated with worsened shock, increased transfusion requirements, and mortality. So, we've talked about vital sign changes associated with shock. Next, let's talk about pertinent physical exam findings in a head-to-toe fashion.
Both the exam and lab findings in shock are often a direct consequence of the decrease in perfusion. Essentially, if we cut off blood supply to that organ, what would happen? Starting with the head and neck, one of the most common manifestations of shock is altered mental status due to decreased cerebral perfusion. Patients may also be diaphoretic and have dry mucous membranes due to overall volume losses. The JVP may be up or down depending on the type of shock. The cardiopulmonary exam often demonstrates tachycardia, tachypnea, and increased work of breathing with accessory muscle use for the reasons just discussed. In the GI and GU systems, patients may show evidence of an acute abdomen with rebound tenderness and guarding, active GI bleeding with hematemesis or blood per rectum, right upper quadrant tenderness in instances of biliary pathology, and decreased urine output. Decreased urine output is an early indicator of decreased renal perfusion. The skin exam helps clarify the patient's overall perfusion status and is important in ruling out any traumatic injuries associated with blood loss. Is the patient warm, cold? Is there delayed capillary refill, which is typically refill taking longer than three seconds? Is modeling present? Modeling is best observed over the knees and is evidence of decreased perfusion of the extremities. Interestingly, modeled skin, especially of the knees, indicates sluggish blood flow and has a likelihood ratio of 13.4 for predicting 14-day mortality in septic shock. In the lower right corner of the screen is an image of progressive modeling of the knee in a patient with septic shock. After the exam, it's time to focus on the labs. In shock, the labs serve as markers of multi-organ dysfunction. As we go through the labs, we will also show the corresponding fishbone diagrams. The CBC is necessary to evaluate for leukocytosis as evidence of infection or inflammation. In addition, anemia may indicate an acute GI bleed. On the BMP, the bicarbonate, BU to creatinine ratio, and anion gap are of great utility. Patients in shock often develop an anion gap metabolic acidosis. In cases of metabolic acidosis, the bicarbonate will be low. Metabolic acidosis in shock is often due to a buildup of lactic acid from the aforementioned overall state of decreased perfusion and tissue hypoxia. Why does this lactic acidosis occur? In shock, there is insufficient oxygen supply which forces the cell into anaerobic metabolism. Therefore, pyruvate is metabolized to lactate, which continues to accumulate as long as perfusion is limited. The BU to creatinine ratio is a marker of renal perfusion. A ratio of greater than 20 to 1 may indicate a pre-renal acute kidney injury. Finally, elevated transaminases, perhaps greater than 1,000, are indicative of hepatocyte necrosis due to decreased perfusion, which is informally referred to as shock liver. As just discussed, a lactate is critical in the shock workup. All right, so we've defined shock and discussed clinical manifestations. Next, we transition to the types of shock. The four main types of shock are distributive, hypovolemic or hemorrhagic, obstructive, and cardiogenic. Listed below each of these categories are specific examples. Key examples to highlight include both sepsis and liver failure cause distributive shock, GI bleed and trauma are common causes of hypovolemic shock, massive PE, tamponade, and tension pneumothorax are causes of obstructive shock, and left ventricular failure can lead to cardiogenic shock. Now, with these categories and examples in mind, let's work through a physical exam-based approach for going through this differential in an undifferentiated shock patient. Referring back to the beginning of the session, mean arterial pressure equals cardiac output times the systemic vascular resistance. Shock is defined by a decrease in MAP. Therefore, there are two ways to get there, either by decreasing the cardiac output or by decreasing the systemic vascular resistance. In sepsis, the SVR decreases, which causes a compensatory increase in cardiac output. Therefore, the first branch point in our approach will be the cardiac output. The first thing to ask when evaluating an undifferentiated shock patient is, is the cardiac output increased or decreased? Cardiac output is increased in sepsis and liver failure and decreased in nearly all other forms of shock. Septic shock can be referred to as high output hypotension for just this reason. What are some manifestations of high cardiac output that we can look for at the bedside? Fever, Increased pulse pressure, meaning a larger difference between the systolic and diastolic pressures, often due to a decreased diastolic pressure, warm extremities, bounding pulses, and known or suspected evidence of infection. If the cardiac output is decreased, the next thing we look at are the neck veins. Ask the question, are the neck veins empty or full? Empty veins, meaning the lack of JVP elevation, indicates that the intravascular space is depleted and the patient is hypovolemic. The history and initial exam often help point towards a hypovolemic state, as the patient will report either heavy GI losses, there will be evidence of GI bleeding on exam, or a clear traumatic injury in the surgical world. Full veins, or elevated JVP, mean the intravascular space is either too full or something is blocking the flow of blood. If the veins are full, the next thing we evaluate is breath sounds. Ask, 
Are the breath sounds clear or are there deep ending crackles? Full neck veins with clear breath sounds tells us that something is happening before the left side of the heart. Specifically, something has to be impeding the flow of blood into the lungs because the lungs are clear. Therefore, the patient is in some form of obstructive shock and we need to think about massive PE, cardiac tamponade, tension pneumothorax, etc. If the veins are full and there are deep ending crackles, that suggests cardiogenic shock and failure of the left side of the heart. In this case, the dependent crackles are due to cardiogenic pulmonary edema. If we have reached the end of this process and there is still no clear diagnosis, ask, could there be a combination of things going on? For instance, could the patient be in septic shock with subsequent LV dysfunction? Or is the patient in septic shock but also profoundly hypovolemic? Taking a step back, the bolded letters in this diagram spell shock. They also represent the main types of shock that we recently discussed. After considering combinations, if the diagnosis is still unclear, we then consider additional causes, including adrenal insufficiency or anaphylaxis, and weird electrolytes and vitamins, for example thiamine, which may cause shock due to a wet or dry beriberi and hypocalcemia, or that perhaps we did it with sedatives and vasoactive drugs. Overall, this is our shock and awe approach at the bedside for an undifferentiated patient in shock. To summarize, in this session, we define shock as a state of inadequate perfusion or oxygen supply to meet demands of the body. We then described common clinical manifestations of shock, reviewed the broad differential for shock, and then discussed the shock and awe physical exam-based approach for working through that differential at the bedside. In subsequent sessions, we will focus specifically on septic shock, hemorrhagic shock due to GI bleed, and cardiogenic shock. Thank you for your participation.